Hello YouTube, this is Morgan Airspeed Prime here with my next Avatar news update video. And this time, actually we have a pretty big one, and that is that we have preview pages for Legend of Korra Runes of the Empire Part 2, as well as preview pages for Team Avatar Tales as well. I'm focusing primarily on the core stuff because Team Avatar Tales, as you probably know, isn't shaping up particularly well, but we'll get into that at the end. We'll focus on the actually interesting stuff first. So, um, randomly here, uh, Doom Rocket, this site called DoomRocket.com, they get the exclusive uh, preview. This time it's eight pages. Um, I still don't really get why they'd never consider really giving preview pages to like fan sites or anything like that. It always has to be some comic-focused website rather than the fandom. But anyway, not a lot to say here in terms of the um, kind of text of the article. It's basically just, this is what this series is. You know, basically to people who aren't really aware of what it is. November 12th is the, is the release date. Here's the artist, you know, creative team, stuff like that. And then, as you can see here, eight preview pages. But I have them open here in a bigger view. So you can see here. So uh, you can't see the URL uh, on the screen recording, but uh, this is listed in the URL as being page number two, page uh, zero two. So uh, yeah, it seems like very early on in the book, we are starting off with uh, Wu heading into the Foggy Swamp, uh, or the Swamp, which gets a name here for the Foggy Bottom Swamp, which is interesting. And uh, yeah, Wu is going to be going in there with uh, Korra, of course. And he's going to be bringing plenty of bug spray. And he's got his kind of adventure outfit on. They're going in on Naga. Uh, again, I, I really like the colors here. Uh, the art from Michelle Wong is ever is very, very good. Um, and you can see here is Korra and Asami saying goodbye here. Nice little effect there of, you know, Korra giving herself like a little airbending boost to get up on Naga. Um, but yeah, that's the first page. Pretty nice. Here is page 03, so the one directly after that. And we see them heading off. We also see Mako and Bolin are here as well. Good luck. Say hi to Toph for me. So this is them heading off into the swamp to go get Toph, as was the plan at the end of Runes of the Empire Part 1. And we see looking through binoculars from a distance are some of um, the, er the Earth Empire soldiers that are left over. So these are obviously working for Guan and Dr. Shang. And they say that it's time, so they're planning something. We go into page 04, again, the one directly after this. And we see here Asami saying to, I suppose, the engineer slash captain here, uh, we're ready for takeoff. Um, Asami's obviously in charge here, so it must be like the engineer or just the pilot. Uh, he says yes. And yeah, Kubir and Asami get a little bit of a chance here to talk. Don't suppose you're going to let me out of here? Not until we arrive in Zhao Fu. Sue told me she has a nice cell waiting for you. Terrific, I'll get to trade one platinum prison for another. So again, platinum being the unbendable, even by metal benders, metal. But uh, yeah, that's the plan. So when they get to Sue, they're just going to transfer her to a different cell. Because obviously she did act out a bit at the end of the last volume. But it means we are sort of heading for Sue, which is, I suppose, a good thing. So, Miss Sado, I'm afraid we're going to be delayed. The engines won't start. So something's gone wrong here. Is it sabotage? More than likely it is. And Asami says here in the next page, 05, that's odd, they were working fine on the way here. We see Malcolm Bolin here, also Pabu. I think I might know why you're having engine trouble, and how would you know that? I suggest you let me out of here now. They're obviously asking why. She knows some sort of an attack is coming. I wonder how, though. Uh, maybe she can sense the metal bending happening or something like that, but... Uh, yeah, that, that, that's probably it to some degree. Since she's a metal bender, she can probably sense through the ship that there's something up. Um, whereas, like, otherwise there is no metal bender on board. Maybe it's something like that. Some sort of metal bending sense. But either way, they, they burst in through the windows here. Everyone is surprised. Kavira says that's why. Uh, and yeah, big action scene about to take place here. We get page 7 as well. So Mako... Uh, with the bad hand there, you can see the burns there, fire bending. So that is, I suppose, ultimately what we were waiting for. Waiting to find out if Mako could fire bend with a bad hand. And it seems like he can. So yeah, that's confirmation there. It's enough to send one guy flying, so it's not like it's a weakened blow or anything like that. So that's really cool to get confirmation of that, that Mako's kind of back up and running. Seemingly 100%. It's probably not the... It, you know, it's obviously going to be like a lasting injury, but he can still, you know, do stuff. Um, yeah, Bolin obviously has no earth to work with. He's not a metal bender, so he's in a bit of a trouble here. So he dives for cover, grabs the chair, and yeah, wrestling style chair to the back here. Uh, takes out one uh, Earth Empire guard here. 
very nice and it makes sense like but bowling is just so kind of big and strong like this this is just as good as earth i suppose ultimately um big hard chair to the back takes guys out the next pa two pages the last two pages of the preview are actually page 24 and 25 so we skip a, a, a decent bit to get in here so it shows that at least the first you know third or so of the book is all you know just one continuous kind of sequence um uh, and it'll take a little bit to get further into the book i suppose but anyway, um, so they arrive here at the tree. So Toph, hello, uh, Wu is there. I wonder maybe she's moved on. No, I saw her through the vine. So Cora used the sort of energy bending sort of vine sensing technique in the swamp. And she says, I know that you're in here, of course. I'll wait as long as it takes. And you can see a face beginning to form here in uh, the wall here of the tree. Um, uh, as Wu walks by, he notices this and of course screams. And as we go into the last page, Cora's like, yes, I knew it, and she says, curse you and your avatar powers, and Wu says, you know, I thought it was seeing things again. Uh, so we see that she's come out of the wall here with some earth, and she calls Wu, who's Spindle Shanks over here? So that's interesting, and it's interesting that she just doesn't know who he is. So, Toph, this is King Wu, and he says, it's an honor, and she just says, no offense, but I've never been a fan of the monarchy, and he just says, understood, ma'am. So, that's where we end it with Toph, uh, Korra and uh, Wu meeting Toph here to try and convince her to get involved in the election. Now, we know from the cover for part three of Rims of the Empire that Toph is going to be sticking around in this book. So we don't know, I think, for sure if Toph is indeed going to get involved politically, but she stays involved with the book where we go from here. So whatever they say, it's obviously enough to get her to kind of get involved in this to a certain degree but not the full thing so based on what top has said in the show i i i understand why she's staying out of things you know her time getting super involved in this stuff is over so i don't think she'd want to be a candidate even if it is her hometown maybe she'll think differently once that's specifically mentioned once gao ling is brought up uh, but we also have to see how sue plays a bigger role i assume her running for something is going to come up but um either way Wu and Toph is going to be interesting um usually this would probably be just a comedy scene of Toph being in full control but, but because Wu has sort of matured a lot over the last couple of appearances at the end of book four plus what we've seen so far in the comics he could actually have an interesting role here in terms of convincing Toph to play some role uh given that he seems to be a much better public speaker now so um Still, could be very interesting. So, yeah, I, I like this preview. You know, um, how much ground does it actually cover? I'm not exactly sure. But, you know, getting into the swamp here to find Toph at the start. Um, uh, the ambush from uh, Guan's forces. Um, setting up that, you know, Sue will have a prison waiting for Kavira. Decent action scene here uh, that at least shows off some stuff with Mako firebending. Bolin using a chair while he has no earth or lava. Uh, and then, yeah, getting to see Toph. Toph making her sort of debut in the comic here. So that's pretty nice. And then I think Wu coming with them was sort of a little bit unexpected. You know, he he, was, he played a decent role in the first part, so it makes sense. And uh, yeah, because he's not as annoying anymore, that's actually a, a pretty good thing that he's here. So um, it, just a different dynamic that we're going to get. So um, yeah, I, I, I'm intrigued to see where we go from here. So there's still loads of the book we don't know anything about. So basically like the last like 50-ish pages, we still don't really know anything about. But I think that's a, that's a pretty good preview. Like obviously it doesn't spoil or tell us really anything about what we really want to know about, which is more on Kuvira, more on Kuvira and Sue's dynamic. That whole thing is, I think, what everyone wants to know about coming out of this. Where are they going with Kuvira as a character? But um, it's just, I think, a solid, solid uh, look into what's happening so far. So while editing this video, I did actually find eight more preview pages on Edelweiss, which you can see here. Um, so sorry if this feels very disconnected from like the rest of the video that the first part about Runes of the Empire, the first preview pages and then the Team Avatar Tales bit later on in the video is recorded before this section but it was either this or re-record the whole video. I thought this was best to just edit this scene in the Runes of the Empire section but anyway here these pages are open up uh, at full size. And as we can see, it is eight full new preview pages. Uh, we don't have page numbers for any of them, but you can clearly get a sense for where some of them take place. 
So uh, very clearly, I think between the top pages from the first preview and this one, there's at least probably, you know, a couple of pages between them. Uh, about the explanation, Cora explaining to Toph everything. But uh, what we get here is, you know, Governor Toph Bei Fong has a nice ring to it, don't you think? Sound like this Guan character is a real piece of work. I'd like to put uh, a guy like him in his place. But she says no. So what she says here is, Angatara and Sokka lived for all that political hoo-ha. Me, I always saw government as a giant pool of mud. Uh, anyone who falls into it is going to come out filthy. Count me out. Uh, which is what makes you perfect for the job. Uh, you tell it like it is, you're incorruptible. Uh, if you hadn't noticed, I hate being around people. What makes you think I want to be uh, of service to them? Uh, don't you want to make a positive uh, difference in Gaoling? It's your home state. I despise growing up there. And Wu gets all disappointed and it's like, I think it was a mistake coming here, Cora. Maybe Auntie Hu Ting was right after all. And Cora's like, that's it. Wu, wait. And she whispers something to Wu. And then Toph is like, wait, what are you whispering about? And then clearly there's some form of pages between then and this page because Toph has agreed to come with them. So what has Korra said about all this? Because th this is pretty interesting in that like Hu Ting obviously reminds uh, Korra of something and then she tells Wu to do something based on that. So I don't really know what it is like because they've obviously told her about these elections so she knows the idea is that the monarchy is not going to remain in power so what exactly is this about what would prompt Toph to say yes to this maybe I'm just I'm completely not thinking of something but uh, I really can't think of what it could be so either way um Something happens and stops Naga. Uh, Wu, stay put. Uh, Toph, uh, I might need some backup. You got it. Uh, and then the person driving the truck there says, you need to follow me. I'm not going anywhere with any of Guan's lackeys. I'm no lackey and it's Kuvira. Kuvira wearing full um, Earth Empire outfit driving a car. So obviously this connects a lot of stuff together. Last time we saw Kavira in the previews, from the first preview, obviously the, the attack came in and she said, you know, you need, you guys need to get me out. So clearly whatever happens there, um, they end up losing, because as, as we'll go through these, we'll see what kind of has happened. Um, you know, the others seem to get captured. Kavira is the only one who manages to make it out alive and she comes to find Korra. So Korra's immediately like, where are Sami, Mako and Bo Lin? So I'll explain everything, but we need to get off the road um, before someone spots us. Guan's at the airfield waiting to ambush you. And of course, Korra is going to attack because she doesn't know where Asami Mako and Bolin are. I warned you if you hurt my friends, I would take you down. I didn't harm them, I swear. Very interesting firebending that she's doing actually there in that she obviously has the fist there. She's fired at Kuvira. But she's sort of almost, it seems like she's holding that fire in place. Like she's almost like created a ring of fire around Kuvira. Uh, but Kuvira is just speaking back. I didn't harm him, I swear. So where are they? Why are you wearing that uniform? Uh, then we clearly skip on a little bit more again. I get the feeling this is probably much later on in the book. I think a good amount of time has passed to get Sue and Co involved. M maybe I could be wrong about that because uh, they said they were kind of coming anyway. It's so good to see you, Grandma Toph. So Opal is here, uh, as well as Wei and Wing. Too bad it's not under better circumstances. So Sue and Kavira walk past each other. Nothing said. And Sue just talks to Korra. What are you waiting for? You go. I'm I'm not leaving without a Sammy, Mako, and Bo Lin. And this is where we get the explanation. So I assume this is explained before. But Dr. Shang uh, used some kind of magnetic technology to intensify the effects of brainwashing. I don't know how to reverse it, but if we go back to Zhao Fu, then maybe I'm not going to abandon my friends to that madman. And Kubira just says, understood. So clearly along the way here, um, you know, Kubira has gained like this. She, she appreciates the loyalty that Korra and her friends have to each other and can get behind that. So I get the feeling Kubira might volunteer to go with Korra if it's allowed here. Um, but if Kavira does stay behind, it does give her the opportunity to talk to Sue, which is the dynamic everyone wants. But I also get that Kavira, ta uh, Kavira and Korra is also going to be an important one. But I think we know that, like, I suppose Kavira-Toph could also be an interesting dynamic. But um, 
either way, magnetic t technology to amplify it. So clearly, they've managed to, I think, weaponize this. It's not some sort of a case anymore where Guan and his forces have to capture whoever they're brainwashing and then do it to them while they have them unconscious, basically. It seems like they've turned it into a weapon where they can just hit you with the kind of uh, magnetic ray and it has the same effect. That makes that very a very, very powerful weapon. So... Um, uh, obviously, the, the the question is, in the middle of all of this, how did Kuvira get out? Who let her out? Was it the Sami? Was it Mako? Was it Bolin? Who let Kuvira get away to potentially, um, you know, uh, get word out? Because I, I suppose what must have happened is that one of Mako, Bolin, and Asami must have got hit by the ray, and then they must have helped the, the, the rest of the guards take out the rest of Team Avatar. Uh, to the point where whoever was left felt like the only option would be to free Kavira to somehow get out of this alive um, or you know have hope going forward but anyway uh, last few pages here again clearly a, a decent amount of time passes so whatever happens here is that okay the airship never takes off so Kavira and Korra potential oh, Kavira's there so Korra must go off on her own and then before anyone else can arrive or anything like that it's weird how this works because like, if you go back to the previous page like there's Guan's forces arriving so is, is Korra sticking around but then why isn't she here in the middle of all of this clearly something delays everyone and the fight happens right here so we see Wei Wing and Sue fighting they take some of Guan's guards Guan is there Opal you can see in the background uh, they they ask get to move in and then you see Sue, Toph and Kavira do some really big earth bending to take the advantage and that's where we end off the preview um it's very interesting to see what happens here like does is Korra uh, does Korra like go like a long way around on Naga or something like that has she gone into the ship uh that's that's the the difficult thing to tell uh, in all of this um Opal might have her bison juicy with her maybe somewhere and maybe Korra's gone off on that uh it's, it's hard to really tell exactly but it seems like Kuvira does stick around with uh, Sue and Toph, which is interesting. That means we're, we'll probably get some opportunity for Sue and Kuvira dynamic, which we've been waiting for. But uh, yeah, th this secondary preview, I, I do like it. Um, it looks like there's going to be a very interesting reveal that comes out. Whatever Korra says to Wu to convince Toph, I really want to know what that is now. Um, I, w I really want to see how the fight ends now, knowing that super early on in the book is when Team Avatar is taken out and brainwashed setting up the uh, cover for part three um so very very interesting stuff overall here but uh yeah uh, I'm just gonna let myself from the past continue the rest of the video now anyway so now we we'll move on to uh talking a little bit about uh, Team Avatar Tales so Obviously, uh, Runes of the Empire Part 2 is the fur like the furthest out of the more recent books in that it's coming in November, November 12th specifically, everywhere. Uh, Team Avatar Tales is actually coming out October 2nd, 2019. It has that weird thing of it has the comic book store release date first on the Wednesday, October 2nd, and then it's October 15th for everywhere else. So it's going to have that awkward release date, that awkward gap between comic book store date and being available digitally and from everywhere else but what it means is that we actually get uh imbalance part three on the first of october and then some people will be able to get this book on the second of october and um, so that's pretty interesting now for me assuming i get approved for my review copy for these books i should be able to of course get the full spoiler reviews out for both of these books uh, on those days the first and the second but have to wait and see on that so yeah this book uh, hasn't been getting a lot of attention. I, I, I understand, and understandably so, not many people are talking about it because it just hasn't done anything to show any real hype to anything to justify getting overly excited about. And yeah, now that we have some preview pages, um, I think it further doubles down on the fact that something went kind of wrong with this book. And I think it was from the very start, the basic concept that they really didn't have a, a, an idea for anything particularly that they wanted to say with this book but let's get into it so uh first up we have the edelweiss uh, preview pages so you can see here they uploaded uh, it's about eight pages so let's get into them here so you can see here it's just basically because it covers so many short stories it's basically just like a page focusing on one of the stories so 
Uh, obviously, the first page there on the left is from Rebound. We've obviously seen that before. It's getting a reprint here. Um, it's first, like, proper printing. That's not exclusive. Uh, and then the second page is from a story called uh, The Substitute, um, which we'll get into in a second because we have the uh, kind of a table of contents page from the other preview. But this is just Sokka getting, um, you know, recognized as, oh, you look like this person on the picture. It's a teacher position and he's forced into a teaching role. It's only a quick story. But either way, that's two stories. One we've seen, one we haven't seen. And then here we go. Uh, the page on the left here is from Shells, which was a free comic book day book we've seen before. And then Sokka's poem, which is just a two page story that we've seen both pages of already. Back in uh, April last year, we actually saw the previews for this or the full story, basically. So we get a page of that here that said actually drawn by Jean Yang, which is interesting. Um, next two pages here we get uh, Boulder, the Boulder and uh, and his cat or whatever it's called. We'll, we'll get the titles right in a second. But uh, anyway, we saw that at uh, we basically saw the full. Maybe we're missing one or two pages from this book, and it's um, obviously you know the, the the Boulder and his cat. New York Comic Con last year they showed this as preview pages there, and we did get to see all of them. So again, we've seen that before. Uh, this last one here. Um, I'm not really sure about this one. I think this is meant to be the story called Origami. I think it's the only one that fits that we haven't seen before. But uh, we'll have to wait and see exactly on that. But I think that's meant to be the story called Origami. Uh, and then the last ones here. So we have Sisters, which we've seen before. That was one of our free comic book day books. And then the last one I think very clearly has to be from the story called The Scarecrow about pumpkins. Uh, which again is is our first time seeing something from this story itself, so that's pretty interesting. But the other preview um, comes from. Uh, let me get back up to the top of this here. Actually, um, <clears throat> the other preview came from uh, I think a newsletter that Dark Horse put out. Where if you go into it, uh, there's a a link to a preview for this book. So uh, yeah, you see the the amount of creators on this book here. Uh, and we get, yeah, table of contents. So first up in the book is Rebound. Makes sense. It's probably the best book in, in the book. Uh, the substitute, which we went over, is that Sokka one where he puts that mustache on and is recognized as being a teacher for hire. Uh, Shells, we've seen before. It's a free comic book day book, one of the reprints. Uh, Sokka's poem is the quick two-page uh, story, uh, obviously from Jean Yang. So that's pretty interesting. Toph and the Boulder, we've seen before. Um, uh, origami, I think, is one of those pages. I'll, I'll show that page again in a second to see can we match it up uh, by Kiku Hughes. Uh, we, I, I think that's our first time seeing anything about that. Sisters is our the other reprint about Tai Lee. And then the Scarecrow is the one that I, I showed you there before. I think it was one of the last pages. So, yeah. So then preview pages wise, they just show you uh, some of Rebound. So this is the first couple of pages of the book. Uh, Rebound, again, we've seen this before, no need to talk about it. Amazing uh, short comic here, great lead into Smoke and Shadow. Uh, probably the most important setup kind of type scene for one of the comics. So uh, that's really good. We do get the first couple of pages here for the substitute here. So this is the, the setup here. So uh, Sokka wants some snacks um, and uh, yeah. This is uh, where they're, they're sort of hiding out, as you can see here, because they're undercover in the Fire Nation. Um, Aang also wants snacks, and he says that the way to go out without being recognized is to put on a disguise. So he puts on a mustache, and um, yeah, he looks like a weirdo, but he's going to save them all by getting some snacks. <clears throat> so he heads out there, sings about a mustache, and uh, goes to get some snacks from the snack shop, and he orders two packs of mochi, two cartons of ice cream, two dozen cookies, and ten fruit tarts. Uh, takes it all home. He's recognized by some soldiers here as being the teacher from this poster, and basically he's being brought in as the substitute teacher because there's been a problem. And uh, yeah, our local teacher stopped showing up. Kids can be a little rough sometimes, so he's being put in charge of the um, uh, the bad class, I suppose, here. So, yeah, we just end end with this little section of seeing him. Yep, yeah, Sokka's going to have to teach. Now, what we know of this book from the table of contents, as you can see up here. Let me get back up to it. Uh, this book, this specific story is going to be... Uh, <clears throat> so, what is that? 
uh, about seven pages long is that so yeah 14 15 16 17 18 19 20 21 uh, 20 actually so yeah seven pages exactly and we have here um, how many pages do we have so we get to see one two three four pages so there's still three more pages of the, of the substitute to see and do we actually get a different page when we get it here? No, th that's one we've seen before. So we have three more pages of the substitute. Again, you don't, I don't really know how much more they can do in just three pages because it's not the same school as obviously from the headband. So uh, I'm not really sure what they can do here. Uh, it feels a little uninspired in my mind as a story just because like, okay, Sokka likes his disguises, but he has such specific disguises that like, I think if he was doing this, he'd just go for some sort of an alteration of Wang Fire and be going down that road. So it, that's why it feels a little uninspired that it's just like, oh, a different mustache disguise. Great. It's just like, and, and especially when like one of the books from like uh, The Lost Adventures was also sort of, you know, Sokka getting sort of almost like recognized by his uh, alter ego. This feels super uninspired because of that as well. But uh, yeah, let's go back to uh, the table of contents here and try and figure stuff out. So, um, so in this book, obviously, what we have here is overall, how many stories do we have here? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight stories, three of which are reprints. They are the free comic book day books. And I think they are ultimately going to be the best three stories in the book of the five remaining one of them is a two-page story that is just a Sokka's poem uh, uh, illustrated by Jean Yang. So that's more or less a non-event because it's only two pages. Which leaves the substitute, which we've seen here, is a very Sokka-focused, just disguise, as I already talked about. Kind of uninspired, doesn't seem all that great unless something amazing happens in the last three pages. Um, then we have Toph and the Boulder, which is a longer story, and we've seen most of it. I think it's at the very least a fun and entertaining story in that it's Toph, of course, the boulder, the boulder has a cat. There's a, That's a fun dynamic going on there, but it's just a, you know, a guy is a cat. Like, boulder surprises you by having a cat, and it's just all about that. There's nothing particularly interesting going on. Um, we'll skip origami for a second. Sisters, we know what it is. The scarecrow, uh, I think, is all but very likely is what this uh, second page here on the right is from because they're talking about you know uh him trying trying to protect his pumpkins and stuff like that monsters so he needs a scarecrow for his field what exactly is it going to be how's it going to work there's potential here i don't think the art style is going to lead to it being anything more than just a quick sort of comedy little moment uh, the moon is out in the sky, so maybe we'll see some powerful water bending. maybe? Uh, that could be interesting, but either way, uh, I think this is just going to be a fun, weird thing with whoever actually has to act as the Scarecrow. I get the feeling they might force Sokka to be the uh, Scarecrow or something like that, um, but uh, yeah. Uh, which means that the only story that we don't know anything about is Origami. Which leaves the only mystery being these pa this page here, as you can see here. So what happens on this one is there's a Fire Nation soldier, a guy who looks like he's probably Earth Kingdom. He gets hit by water from Katara, um, the, the firebender soldier does, so Katara does some water bending. Momo jumps on the guy's head. We see that there is some, it, it looks like very much like it's an Earth Kingdom town. Places burned on fire. Uh, did we miss something? Not much. Katara solved this. What, what, what's going on in this story? It seems like ultimately it's going to be Katara focused because um, it looks like Sokka and Aang go to do something and in the meantime Katara solves it. But it's just one page of a story which is going to be, what's that, six pages? So 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, no five pages actually only for that one. So we've seen one of them. So overall, it's kind of like, I don't know what there is to get excited for with this book. I'm excited to, to have like a physical copy of Rebound and Sisters, because I couldn't get those books on those free comic book days. I have the individual issue that has shells in it. 
So I'm, I'm excited to get those stories because I think Rebound's very good. I actually think Sisters is quite good as well. And then Shells is always nice, nice to have. Especially after the rise of Kyoshi, Shells actually has more Kyoshi information in it with like the formation of the, the Warriors of Kyoshi kind of story. Um, everything else just seems rather dull. Now, I, I think it, everything is pretty much at this stage on if origami has more to it than just a quick, you know, oh, look at Katara, Katara's awesome, you know, she saw something on her own in a handful of pages, and then if they can somehow manage to make something important and interesting happen in the Scarecrow. Um, otherwise, this seems like a massive, massive letdown. Why were we waiting so long for this book? Why, why, why all the delays about this book? Why is it taken, like, over a year? Why has it been delayed by over a year? given the quality of this book, given three of the books were already done going into this, leaving only, you know, like 50 or so pages to be accomplished. And then given that, like, last year we know that, uh, last year at New York Comic Con, so at least by October, we know Toph and the Boulder was done. That's one of the longer books. We know from April this year, Sokka's poem was done. That was two pages. Um, so what was going on with some of the other books like the, what what took this long to bring this project together when there was nothing particularly serious going on i don't feel like you know mike and brian needed to be consulted on a lot of this stuff given how unimportant it all feels so what's the story with this book i i just feel like this is like right now i can almost like without having to read the full book be like this is a not not really a must-have book and i think that's like a first for the avatar comics that it's a piece of content like a full book that i i really i'd struggle to recommend it based on what we've seen so far which is actually a large part of the book so like if we're counting this up like what have we, what haven't we seen from this book three pages of the substitute um I think we do have the full Toph and the Boulder story. Maybe we're missing two or so pages. I have to go back and see the, the pictures that we got. Um, but let's say we have the full story for that. Origami, we have one out of five pages, so four more. So that's, um, what, seven pages total that we haven't seen. And then the Scarecrow up to about page 72. So 11. So there's only, what, 18 pages we haven't seen from this book maybe 20 if you want to say Toph and the Boulder has maybe a page or two at the end that we missed. Um, I, I don't think it's too much to say that just this is a bit of a dud of a book that not a lot of people are going to be interested in and I, it's going to be interesting to see what happens given that it's out the day after uh, Imbalance Part 3 which is going to have so many people talking about it. I think this book is going to get completely lost, completely swamped in the middle of everything else. So um, yeah. That, that, that's basically the video, so uh, really good uh, preview here for uh, Runes of the Empire. Uh, I think lots of fun stuff to kind of get into here, even if it's not the most important stuff in the book. The art, I think, looks fantastic, colors look fantastic, and yeah, it, it feels important as a book uh, versus probably the least important piece of content we've seen so far in a while. Team Avatar Tales. Uh, real kind of mixed bag of news uh, with the previews this week. But um, in the comments, let me know what your thoughts are. How do you feel about Team Avatar Tales? Um, you know, are you going to pick it up or are you just plain not interested after we've seen most of the book at this point? And then, especially, uh, Runes of the Empire Part 2. What are your thoughts heading into this, given that, you know, we've seen Wu is here, this attack coming in on the airship and stuff like that. How excited are you for this? But uh, that's been the video. Thanks for watching and bye.